right, guys, so now we're going to move on to the next part of our course for today. So we're going to talk about some skeletal anatomy from Chapter 5. All right, so maybe take some notes because I'm going to be asking some questions. And I'd also like to pass out this handout now. I want to have a look at it and pay special attention to the bone human skeleton one at the top there. All right, so I got a question for you. Does anybody know how many bones are in the human skeleton? Anybody? No? All right, so there are 206 bones in the average adult. All right, and all of your bones are joined together by tendons and ligaments. Basically, the, the bone structure forms the protective framework of your body, and it also provides an area for muscles to attach. And I'd like to also talk about the differences between male and female bones. Male bones tend to be a little bit heavier, also a bit larger than female. And the female pelvic cavity is quite a bit wider in relation to male for accommodating childbirth. Also, the skeleton has about four functions, four major functions. First one that I already touched on is the protective framework. This protects all of your vital organs, protects your tissues, all of the soft parts of your body. Uh, it also serves as a factory for red blood cells, kind of a reservoir for those types of things. It stores minerals, and uh, main minerals are calcium and phosphate. All right, and like I said before, it also provides the attachment for your muscles to adhere to and basically provide movement. So if we didn't have a skeleton, we wouldn't uh, have any structure. It would just be like a big amoeba oozing along the floor. All right, so our bones are made up of uh, about 50% even fluid, 50% solid. Okay, so the minerals make it hard, make it rigid, and the protein makes your bones strong. Okay. Now, uh, bones are also classified according to their shape. So we have uh, long bones, we have flat bones, we have short, and we have irregular. So if you take a look at uh, your handout here, table 5.1, classifications of bones. First one talks about the long bones. So examples of long bones are your femur and, or femur and your humerus. And these basically serve as levers. So, you know, when you move that bone, it creates a large movement, right? Then we have our short bones. So, for example, the tarsals and the carpals. And those are kind of in your ankles and your wrists. And those give strength to your joints. So they don't provide a lot of movement. They just sort of give it some extra additional strength. Okay, then we have our flat bones. Examples of those are your ribs or your scapula, the back. All right, and that provides a broad site for the muscles to attach onto. And because they're also flat bones, they also provide a lot of protection for those internal organs as well. Um, finally, we have our irregular bones, for example, the pubis and the vertebrae in the back here. Um, those protect the internal or organs as well, and they also just provide that additional structure and support to the body. So not a whole lot of movement coming from those bones, uh, but definitely a lot of function. All right, so we'll move on here. So the skeleton is made of two parts. It's divided into two sections. The first one is the axial skeleton, which is comprised of your skull, your ribs, and your sternum, or the breastbone. And the second part is the appendicular skeleton, so which is comprised of the two limb girdles, your pelvis and your shoulder and the attached limbs, okay? So the axial skeleton doesn't provide a lot of movement. You know, we can move our ribs, you, can, you can't really move your skull, but it, it, there are, there's a little bit of movement there, whereas the appendicular skeleton is what controls all of your limbs and, and that sort of thing, so you get a lot of movement from that part of the skeleton. That's just how it's divided. Okay, so now, does anyone know what anatomical position is? Anyone have an idea? Isn't that just when a person stands up straight? Yeah, that's right. Uh, to be a little bit more technical, it's when somebody stands with their hands at their side, standing straight, with their palms facing forward. Okay? Now, does anybody know why we use anatomical position as a point of reference? Isn't it something about where the movement starts? Yeah, basically, 
it describes movement and also body parts. So the body parts are described in relation to one another from anatomical position and the movement you can use you know the terminology the proper terminology that you need to describe where the movement comes from from anatomical position so it's basically just a start point so that you can describe how and where the, the body is moving from okay so have a look at your uh, at your handout the top section here, figure 5.1, the human skeleton. All right, I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds to just read over it, see if there are any of the terms that you're familiar with, any that they're not. I'm try and just study it a little bit. And then we're gonna flip it over and I'll ask you a few questions. Just have a look. Which side the tibia and fibula are on? Uh, think, think anatomical position. If you're standing in anatomical position, okay, which side? So the tibia is on the inside, the fibula is on the outside. Right. Think fibula is farthest away in anatomical position. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Um, Kelsey, um, do you know the correct medical term for the shoulder blades and the collarbones? Um, the shoulder blades are called the scapula. That's right. And I can't remember what's the collarbone. Okay, that's okay. The collarbones are your clavicle. Okay. okay. Um, all right. Uh, Sarah, do you know the three major bones in your arms? I believe the uh, upper is the humerus right. and then your forearms is the radius and the Ulna? Yeah, that's right. Uh, how about uh, which side the radius and the ulna is located? Um, think anatomical position again. Okay. For standing in anatomical position. So palms facing out would be the radius. Where? The radius on the outside? Right. Yeah. So ulna on the inside. inside. Right. And another trick like the, uh, like the, the fibula is think the ulna starts with you, so right. from anatomical position, it's closer to you, okay? All right, so we will move on and talk a little bit about the anatomical vocabulary and joint movement terminology that you need when you're describing movements or body parts coming from anatomical position. But uh, before we do that, I'd like to talk a little bit about joints so you have a bit of a groundwork on that. So what are joints? Joints are where bones, meet together and usually where the movement is produced from. All right, now there are three classifications of joints. The first one is uh, fibrous, second one is cartilaginous, and the third one is synovial. So I'll say that again so you can write it down. First one is fibrous, second one is cartilaginous, third one is synovial. So let's talk a little bit about that. So fibrous joints are joints that connect bones together without any movement occurring. So for example, pelvis or the skull, okay? So those are connected together, but they don't provide any movement. So remember that joints are classified on how much movement they produce. All right, now cartilaginous joints are attached by cartilage, hence the name, and they do produce a small amount of movement, but not a lot. So for example, the spine or the ribs, okay? Then we get to synovial. Synovial joints are your ball and socket, freely movable, and also enclosed in an articulating capsule. So it kind of goes like this, all right? And then inside, there's something called synovial fluid, which basically acts as a lubricating agent so that you can produce 
fluid, smooth movements. All right, now there are actually six different types of uh, synovial joints. Um, we're only going to learn three for our purposes today. So just have a look at your, t at your chart again, draw your hand out. And at the bottom there, there's table 5.2, types of synovial joints. So I wanted to just touch base on this. So the first one is your hinge joint. So the hinge joint allows movement in one direction, like the elbow or the knee. All right, the second type is the condyloid synovial joint. And that type of joint allows movements in two different directions. So for example, the wrist goes up and down, but it also goes side to side, okay? Um, then we move on to the ball and socket synovial joint, which is the movement or the joint that allows for the greatest amount of movement. So they're freely movable, they have a large range of motion. So for example, your shoulder, you can go around, you can go up, you can go down, you can go side. So those are what cause the, the most amount of movement are the ball and socket synovial joint. All right, so now we'll, uh, we will move on. Um, we'll take about a half an hour dinner break and then we'll talk about uh, the terminology and the vocab that you'll need to describe those movements. All right, so take a break, see you soon.